right. Thank you. Cool. So I got a really good intro, and uh, thank you, Gian, because like I was wondering how much people in this room are going to be like familiar with Druid uh, coming into this talk, because this talk is about data modeling for Druid. So it really speaks to data engineers or people that will that either um, are loading data into Druid or are thinking about loading data into Druid, um, and it's you know there's there's a little bit of a need for a foundation of understanding what is Druid about and why would you even load data into it in the first place. So I feel like uh, Gian did an awesome job at um, kind of setting the stage for this talk. Um, so yeah, so data modeling for Druid really targeted about like if you are going to, if your job is to load data into Druid or if your job is becoming or part of your job is becoming to, uh, to load some, of the data, some data in Druid. These are the things that you should think about um, and, and consider, or a, or a subset, at least, of the things that you should consider as you, as you do that. Uh, but before I get started, I'm going to give you just a little bit of context on this talk. Um, so the first bit is about me, but uh, I've already been introduced, so, uh, so there's less to say. I used to work, I'm, I'm working at Lyft now, so... Um, I work in between uh, these walls. I used to work at Airbnb, Facebook, Yahoo, um, and a place called Ubisoft, which is, happens to be just a, a block away from here. So I got to San Francisco in uh, 2004, and this neighborhood looked very different at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, so I started uh, Superset, and, um, and maybe an interesting fact about Superset is uh, that Superset started as a uh, hackathon project to build a front end, an open source front end for Druid specifically. So the name of the product at the time was Panoramics. Panoramics is, uh, is a cartoon character who is a Druid. So the name was after Druid and really the intent was, um, you know, I looked at Druid, I was like, wow, this is a lot like, I was coming out of Facebook at a time. And I was like, wow, this database is a lot like the Scuba backend. We need a front end for this thing and we have Scuba again. Um, so uh, I had a three-day hackathon, and uh, the first commit in the repo is, uh, is kind of that early version of, um, of a Druid-only superset called Panoramics. And then, um, so at the time, I was working on Airflow. Airflow is a, is a, workflow, is a workflow engine. It's, it's a way for people to author and monitor uh, uh, data pipelines. So... Um, so I've been working on that over time, and more recently I've been more focused on, on Superset, and now I'm getting back into loading a lot of data into Druid, uh, which brings me to this talk. Um, over time, I became the de facto, or one of the de facto maintainers for a small library called uh, PyDruid, um, and managed to get um, Apache committerhood on Druid as a byproduct of that. Um, I feel like I'm probably the less legit Apache committer on Druid itself, uh, but PyDruid is this like small library that is a client or an interface to to speak into Druid so that you don't have to uh, write JSON. So if you're in the Python world, you can use PyDruid. You can use the the uh, the DB API driver, the SQL Alchemy dialect, and and all sorts of uh, little like client type object objects to interact with Druid. Um, so I want to talk about the motivation for this talk. So the, the, the problem that I'm solving talking about this is um, there's not a lot of information. So if you're trying to use Druid and load data into it, there's a lot of scattered information in the Druid docs. The Druid documentation is great. It's, it's very solid, but it's scattered, and it talks about all sorts of things. And I wanted to have a place where, um, where we have um, all the resources for a data engineer or, or someone or an engineer or someone who's interested in loading data into Druid. Um, here at Lyft, so we're investing into Druid. We think it's awesome. We think you know, it, it supports our, our real times and our um, uh, geospatial use cases. So we're super excited about it. Uh, and we want to ramp up a lot of data engineers and engineer at Lyft to understand how to load it into Druid effectively. So I thought, what about I write you know, a document, like some documentation on this and give a talk, and instead of just scoping it to, um, to the, the, the size of Lyft, I'm like, why not making this open source? So this is all open source products, so might as well you know, do an open uh, blog post and open, open talk on this. Um, so I was going to talk about Druid segments, but I think Gian did already. Um, so I think if you're going to use, uh, you know, if you're going to load data, do some data modeling for a database, um, it's important to understand how this data is stored and how this 
execution engine works. And I think Gian did really good on this. So, uh, so Druid segments, I think, uh, are, you know, fairly compressed and indexed. And I'm not going to get into the details here because we kind of covered that already. Um, but like one thing that's important is to know the fact that they're immutable and that uh, you need to know about that if, if you're thinking about, can I use Druid for this data set? Uh, you have to know that it, it, it is an append-only store where you load data once and you ideally don't touch it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later as to like talking about Lambda architecture and how you would go about corrections and about um, you know ident identifying some of the cases where you might need to reload data, but you definitely don't want to think of Druid as a database that's highly mutable, like traditional um, OLTP kind of databases. Cool. So here I'm getting into a section about tips and tricks. So this talk, I think this talk has um, information that's really targeted about what you need to know if you're going to load data in Druid. But there's a lot of things, too, in this talk that, that are about how to uh, mitigate like space usage and how to summarize your data as you bring it into uh, a database like Druid. But it's not limited to necessarily Druid, per se. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is segment sizes. So the documentation... Uh, on the Druid website says, like, ideally, a segment size should be somewhere in between 300 and 700 megs. Um, I wanted to say that in practice, uh, there are cases where, um, you okay with <laughs> We need to clean up in aisle one, I think. Uh, all right. But, but yeah, so, uh, so the, the doc says that it should be, you know, a certain size to be optimal. Uh, in, in practice and in reality, especially when loading batch data into Druid, for convenience, it might make sense to just operate, say, on a daily basis or on an hourly basis. And uh, it, might, it might happen that you have smaller segments, and then that just means that you would have more overhead on the Druid cluster proportionally, right? So that means the Druid cluster is working a little bit harder, shuffling segments around. Um, but the... It, it's more overhead proportionally, but if you have the same number of segments on a very large data set uh, or you have a smaller data set, so you, you'll have like a fixed amount of overhead, and the reality is that it might not be super significant. Um, if you need to, like, you know, so if you're writing Druid, like if it's a Ferrari and you, you're actually like racing this thing, you might want to consider like really make sure that you hit, you hit the sweet spot there, but you have to balance that with... Uh, just kind of getting work done and getting your data in, too. So it's definitely possible to tweak size. Uh, the obvious thing is to alter your segment granularity. Um, and that might involve also, so say if you're like, oh, you know, these segments are really small, so I'm going to um, use a weekly granularity instead of a daily granularity. Um, you might want to reload the whole, that last segment over and over. Uh, so that you have like data that's not stale, but but still fairly like optimal um, segment sizes, um, and then you know it's always possible to segment beyond time in Druid. You might want to consider that. Uh, so I'm not going to get into um, the details of how partitioning further than time in Druid works, uh, but the documentation is fairly good, and the idea is generally to um, identify which uh, dimension you might, might want to partition on and which, uh, like how you want to configure it. So there's like a handful of options. Uh, so this slide is about blobs. So uh, blobs, we, like in this day and age, we have a lot of blobs, right? So we have uh, kind of a, a rise of the NoSQL databases. We have all these protobufs and, and thrift objects that somehow get serialized into database cells. Um, so your source data might have some columns that look like this. Um, and you probably, like the, the guideline in general with Druid is you probably should not load these blobs uh, directly into Druid. So Druid is not Elasticsearch. Um, it doesn't do full text indexing. It doesn't do full text search. Um, and if you have one of these, uh, like if in your source data you have something that looks like this, what you might want to do is columnize some of it, right? So you'd look at your your blob, think about what's in there, and see what you want to do, whether you want to explode it into multiple rows, whether you want to, to go and kind of cherry pick uh, the columns or the aspects that are uh, most relevant to your data sets. Um, there's also a new feature in Druid, or, or fairly new anyway, so uh, 
the DRID segments used to, so, to store systematically in a bitmap index for every single column, uh, dimension column. Now you can switch that off. So if you're going to load up some text data, at least you can kind of switch off uh, bitmap indexes. And another recommendation I would do is if you're considering loading a blob inside DRID or a large uh, chunk of text, uh, one thing you might want to do if you're concerned about performance is to, uh, to load a segment with and without the blob to at least get a real sense of, in practice, how much does that blob cost? Like, how much is it bloating your segments? And in general, um, like in Jurid, in some cases, when you're thinking about um, aggregation, summarization, uh, or the cost of adding or removing a column, sometimes the easiest way to go about it is to load the data with and without and compare the segment sizes. Uh, there's this thing called smush files, which I won't get into, uh, but, but you know, there's other ways to get more metadata about what's inside your segments. Um, but otherwise, like the easy approach is to just kind of try it with and without and compare the results. So here I want to talk a little bit about uh, this batch ingestion framework that, uh, that we wrote here at Lyft to make it easy to load data into Druid. So the thing is, if you're going to, like, so if I was to give people a laptop here and say, like, okay, you have a CSV file, you know, or you have a file in Hadoop and you want to load it into Druid, like, go and try to do that, uh, you would waste, like, a day or two trying to do this and probably hate your life. Uh, you know, it's very painful to just like use uh, the basic APIs to do this. So I think a lot of companies that are serious about investing into Druid will have some sort of abstraction on top to, make, to commoditize, like just make it easy for anyone in the company that wants to load a data set to do so. Um, so here we wrote something that's called Druid Ingest um, that I'm going to describe very quickly uh, what it does. Um, and we, that's something we may open source later. I think this looks pretty awful. We don't really see too well. Um, but what it is, it's just a Python uh, static object that um, holds configuration. So it's really configuration as code, where we assume that you're going to load data from, um, in our case, Hive into Druid. For us, Hive is really um, just S3 back, so it's just parquet files in S3, essentially, and plus the Hive meta store that informs us as to what, you know, where are all of these partitions located in S3? And what does the schema look like? Um, so, so what this framework is, or what Druid ingest is, is it, instead of writing these large JSON files that uh, the Druid kind of API asks for, we, uh, we kind of uh, define just configuration as code. Uh, it has nice defaults. Uh, it does some validation. It has some, some safeguards. It's all centralized in one place. So instead of having your JSON file, your HQL files, and all that stuff kind of living around a repo somewhere, um, it's kind of all in one place. Uh, Druid ingest also offers a, a small uh, CLI that allows you to, um, to just kind of execute your, your specifications and, and actually load your data, um, you know, quickly and easily. Um, it also has a bunch of utility methods that can be used outside of the context of Druid ingest to do um, to basically orchestrate your stuff. So, um, so in our case, um, on top of Druid ingest, we have an Airflow DAG, which receives or read all of the Druid ingestion specifications. Um, and out of that, like, weaves a DAG of execution. So, so Airflow is just this uh, orchestrator, right, that will take your Druid ingestion uh, specification and generate a set of jobs to run every day, every hour, or however um, you configure your stuff. And out of Airflow, we get a lot of things that you also need. So if you're going to go and load data into Druid every day, you will need things like failure alerts, retries, SLA monitoring, um, other interactions of running jobs that you need before you want to, you might want to prepare your data before you load it into a Druid. So um, so Airflow offers all these things, uh, including things like concurrency limits, so we don't want to like hammer too much the, the Druid coordinator, for instance. So uh, this is all stuff we get for free out of Airflow. So joins. So I said I was going to talk about joins a little bit. So there, there used to be a time where, uh, where joins were not supported in Druid. 
And that was kind of nice in a way, because when you think about like data modeling, and I don't know how many people like know much about data modeling in this place, but I spent 10 years as a data warehouse architect in a previous life. And data modeling is all about thinking how to organize your tables and how to kind of prepare your data so it joins nicely. Um, and you have to think a lot about normalization, denormalization, third normal form, uh, things like uh, star schemas, snowflaking your dimensions. So that stuff is an art. It's extremely complex. Uh, when you, you're given a database that does not support joins, you're like, wow, this is easy. I just need to cram. I just need to denormalize everything and put it in this like, dirty, flat table. And, uh, and, and that's just like easy as a data modeler and easy for the people running queries too, right? The people writing queries are like, which data source should I use? Okay, which columns do I need? There's no like, which col like how should I join this to what and under which circumstances? So, uh, so it used to be um, that case, but denormalizing has also some issues. And I, I try to find some examples of um, like <laughs> where, where, so this is, this is a case, like let's say you're interested in doing analytics on uh, like, like say uh, which artists are popular, who's playing you know, which artists under what platform. So here we can see that the, at the attribute of the artist dimension, uh, like Snoop Dogg essentially is changing name all the time. And if you're, if, it, if you're denormalizing the name of Snoop Dogg into your fact table, um, and you're trying to group by artist names, what you're going to get is a, is a bunch of results uh, that looks like, like basically Snoop won't be top the charts. He won't be the most popular artist, but maybe if you were to aggregate it the right way, it, he would be the, the most uh, you know, popular artist. So this issue with denormalization is real. It's a real problem with, with databases like Druid or flat tables in general, is that the attribute of the dimension, uh, if it changes over time, it will stay the same in the fact. If you wanted to, to kind of clean that up, what you would have to do is rewrite all of your segments. And uh, the whole point of an immutable store is to not to rewrite the segments ever. Um, so uh, to, to solve this problem, and this problem is not the most prevalent one specifically with Snoop Dogg, but it's, it's very common that um, I think it applies, a way to describe it is it applies to all the cases where you're interested in dimensional attributes um, and you're interested in the latest value as opposed to the value of that attribute at the time of the event. Uh, that used to be called, uh, or people call this, slowly changing dimension type one, where you, well, all you care about is the latest value of the dimensional attribute. So uh, Drid does support uh, query time joins now. Um, there's a whole new API, or I, I say new, but I, I, I look at the Druid docs and I was happy to find that it had evolved and now we could do all these things. Um, so there's a way to, to kind of publish uh, these lookup tables to the Druid cluster. And as a data modeler, that's a tool you can use if you have use cases where, um, where it's important to get the latest dimensional attribute you have to use this. It's kind of your only way that or reprocessing all of your segments every day. Um, so there's two types of lookups. Um, one is called injective and the other one non-injective. Uh, the injective one requires a one-to-one -one unique mapping. So that means you absolutely need to have unique value on one side and, uh, and one, the values need to be unique on each side uh, because they are executed on the broker. So you can think of this as the reduce phase of a, of a Druid query. Um, so the broker is then is able to um, to perform that lookup, and it's way cheaper because instead of broadcasting the join to every node that's partakes in the query, only the broker has to do this. Uh, so the non-injective lookups are the ones that are a little bit more expensive. They are broadcast to all of the the, the nodes in the execution plan, um, and they can be one too many. All right, so lambda and compaction. So it's this idea that, um, I, and I believe I saw something around compaction on what's coming up next for Druid. So there's people working on compaction. Uh, but let, let me describe the problem a little bit. So in the Druid architecture, and this slide is unreadable from where you're at, but there's the, the real-time nodes. You can imagine that they're constantly receiving a stream of data and, and, and what I would call like a write-optimized store. 
right? So these, these nodes get a stream of data, they answer a query at the same time, and every once in a while they need to flush the data. So they'll, come, they'll take a segment, they'll, they'll publish a segment to the deep storage and tell the coordinator about it. And that's kind of an atomic operation uh, that works well. The problem with that is that the process, uh, so, so the real-time nodes uh, don't do a super good job at creating segments because there's many of them. And the segments that they write will typically be um, a little smaller than they should be and more fragmented than they should be. So real-time leads to some optimal segments. Um, there's also some like kind of core issues with uh, like the fact that we have this time index um, in Druid. So late arriving facts can be uh, troublesome, right? At some point, you need, to, you need to write that segment. If you write for, if you wait too long, then you have like too much data on the, on the real-time side, on the real-time node side of things. So in some cases, you might have to drop some late arriving facts and hopefully you can fix those later with the Lambda architecture. Um, and then, uh, yes, yeah, some columns might be unavailable at the time in real time, or the join might be too expensive or too complex to bother with it. So an example of that might be something uh, like, at, like at Lyft. For instance, the invoicing information for a ride comes much later after the, the, the ride is closed, right? The invoice might not happen right away. And later on, we get the invoice information, which we'd, we would love to have in that data set, but we can't afford to wait for the invoice to close. So those are all things that you can fix with the Lambda architecture. I think I, I kind of forget to mention what the Lambda architecture is, like kind of uh, just you know, assuming that everyone knew about it, but it's, it's this idea that you stream data on one side, and then you correct data in the background using batch. Right. So these historical correction can tackle these like more complex business rules they can uh they can fix some of these issues right and they can uh defrag your segments too so and i think i don't think there's any automatic mechanisms that do that so i'm not sure where gian is at this point but yeah i'm not sure if there's like any like if are there any mechanisms to compact your segments Okay, so this is changing fast. So, uh, okay. Cool. So, yeah, so GN is saying that this is rapidly evolving and that the problem of suboptimal small segment is getting solved already, kind of using the Kafka indexer. Um, Though, though there are still these other like reasons why you might want to do lambda anyways, right? Like the the problem we were talking about about um, like the invoice information or some um, you know some like very special rides that might get canceled po post you know like you know twelve hours later or these late arriving facts you might want to um, to correct some things. So it's good to know that you can do this Lambda stuff, and that can be part of your pipeline. All right, so now I'm, I'm getting into summarization. I think I'm going to try to accelerate. There's a lot to cover. Um, summarization, why? Because holding a large amount of data in memory is very expensive, right? And at some point, it defies the, the, the limits of physics, right? If you have a gigantic data set, there's no way that you can just store it all um, in memory. So at some point, we have to think about how are we going to mitigate the problem of space and the two main ways to deal with that are aggregation and sampling. Um, talking about aggregation, so, so it's all about like containing the Cartesian explosion. So a Cartesian product is when you take two dimensions and you, you kind of make a matrix with them, right? So you look at all your products times all your customers. You have 100 customers, 100 product. You know, you get 10,000. Uh, you, you, like, you end up with just too many rows at that point in time, right? So... Uh, one thing that's interesting about that is that it's very intricate and it explodes very quickly. If you have like 20 action types with you know, 200 car models, a certain number of hours in a year, and 3,000 counties in the US, you end up with hundreds of billions of rows. Uh, the, thing, the story is a little bit more complicated than that because uh, data is not always dense, right? Not in that matrix. That matrix is not full. Like some cars don't exist in certain counties or are not active uh, for a period of an hour. But it's really hard to predict um, how this happens. What, what I know for a fact is that as you add more dimensions, and I wanted to 
I have a slide on this, but like this, as there's this asymptotical, asymptotic curve that basically, as you add more dimensions, very quickly you get you lose out on your aggregation ratio. So uh, if you have just one dimension, it aggregates very nicely. You get two dimensions, you're a lot less aggregated, and as you you'll just get closer and closer to your um, original number of rows. So if your original data set had a billion rows, it won't take that many dimensions with that much cardinality to get close to a billion rows in your aggregate set. So here in this um, set of slider, this section of the presentation, I'll be talking about ways to mitigate um, that kind of aggregation explosion or Cartesian explosion. Um, and that applies way beyond, I think, like the scope of Druid, right? So that's the part that's relevant to you uh, from a data engineering perspective, regardless uh, if you will load data in Druid. So, um, so yeah, I wanted to say that like, Druid is a little bit confusing at first because there's two levels of aggregations. Uh, one is on ingest. So Druid will, is one of the only databases that assumes that you want to roll up on ingest. And that's a, that can be a little bit tricky because some, like when you run queries on aggregated data, you, might, you definitely don't want to do a min of a max or the sum of an average, right? So you gotta be a little bit careful with that. Um, one thing to note is that you can now switch off roll up as you load that into Druid. Um, so if for a reason or another you wanna have, you know you have atomic events that won't aggregate, you can say do not aggregate on ingest. Um, and then uh, I wanted to say like in our aggregation framework, we label the aggregate functions that we use in the column name. So if we do a sum on ingest, then we will um, like label it into a column, like sum rights, min rights, to make it clear how that data was loaded. Uh, chopping up the long tail, I'm gonna go uh, quickly on this, but it's, if you have like 250 countries, uh, you really care mostly, like a small portion of these countries contribute to a large portion of your data. You can uh, just keep the detail on those, chop off the long tail. Uh, you can do that dynamically or, or in a fixed kind of way. You just got to be careful about the flickering that may happen if you do dynamic long tail chopping, where some countries that are close to, say, the top 50 countries might go in and out of that long tail, and that can, uh, that can confuse users. So uh, bracketing. So that's pretty easy. Um, the thing I wanted to say about bracketing is, in some cases, depending on the density of your data set, going from storing age to storing brackets could solve as much as like a factor of, say, five or 10 on your data, which is kind of um, you know, a big, big savings. Um, I think Gian mentioned sketches a little bit. So I won't, and I'm running out of time, so I won't get very deeply into sketches, but sketches, sketches are extremely cool. Um, there's this Yahoo library that Druid uses that's called Data Sketches. Um, sketches is, are these like lossy data structures that help um, with simplifying, like basically like compressing, like get, saving on storage, saving on computation um, around questions like distant count, distribution, storing sample, frequent items, um, but they do have some complexity implications uh, that I'm gonna skip for now. If people are interested to talk about sketches, maybe uh, I'll be around too af after this talk. Uh, grouping sets, I just saw that uh, they're adding uh, grouping sets to the SQL statement, but one thing you can do, uh, and, and that's not something that we typically recommend for a database like Druid, like we wanna have all our dimension and allow people to slice and dice left and right. But in some cases, you might have to prepare different le level of aggregations up front. Um, so that's where you would say, I'm gonna load this data group by these three dimensions, by these four dimensions, um, and, and provide these different cubes for people to query. All right, so getting into sampling, um, so sampling is a nice thing because you can, you know, so if you decide to store only, say, 1% of your data, um, then you don't have to remove any of the operational data and you don't have any Cartesian explosion, right? You don't have the problem of like, oh, I need to, if I remove this dimension, I'm going to, or if I add a new dimension, all of a sudden I can't afford this data set anymore because it's going to go 10x. So sampling allows you to not worry about everything I talked about like just just now about like Cartesian explosion. 
Um, so if you do sample in Druid, it's really nice, n nice to add a column to your data set called uh, sample rate or sample multiplier. Uh, this allows you to change the sample rate over time, and it also al allows you to heterogeneously sample your data. An example of that might be, you know, if we um, dog food our product here at Lyft, and we have employee data, we might not want to, that's very little data, and we don't want to sample it because we want to look at what employees are doing um, and not a subset of the employees, right? So you can have some rows that are sampled more heavily in the table than others. And when you, the process of upsampling is pretty simple. You create metrics or post aggregators that will simply multiply the sample uh, or the sample multiplier times the indicator you're interested in looking at. Um, and eventually, you could have tools like Superset, like know, like find these columns and kind of do it on your behalf. Um, using normalized metrics, uh, I'm not sure if I'm using that term right, but the, a normalized metric is a metric that, regardless if you're sampling 1% or 10% or 20%, it's metrics that will kind of uh, relate to the same scale, right? So things like the, the P99 time uh, load duration of a page, crashes per user, percentage of canceled rides. Um, all right, I need to accelerate. I think that was my timer. Um, but yeah, essentially the idea of normalized metric is when you're sampling, you look at these norm uh, metrics that are bounded um, and allows you to you know, make sense of your data regardless of, of whether it's sampled or not. Uh, Hash-based sampling, I'm, I'm going to skip, but typically when you sample, you can just sample, say, 1% of the rows, or you can do something like, I'm going to take 1% of the user. So you hash the user ID and take 1% of your users. It allows you to have, um, uh, you know, to, to be able to do things like count distinct users, which you wouldn't be able to do if you sampled randomly. Uh, the, the downside is you can only pick one column, one subject to do that per data set. All right, so I think I'm getting to my conclusion a few minutes late here. So talking about stuff that's on the horizon. So I've been working on this blog post I was hoping to, um, to push out before this talk, but it will come after this talk. So it's going to be uh, titled Data Modeling for Druid, um, and it's going to talk about everything that was in this talk and, and much more probably. Um, one thing I did not talk about is smush files, which are these uh, like kind of internal files to Druid that have a lot of information about segment metadata that seems like a treasure chest of things that, that we'd love to uh, make more viable. So hopefully that becomes more viable or we can build some tooling to introspect these files and kind of open up that, that treasure for people to, um, to really understand what their segments are made out of. Um, and, you know, the Druid Ducks are super great. So all, that, all this information comes mostly from the Druid Ducks, from the, the Google group. Um, so the community is super active. There's tons of information. So uh, there's a lot there. So thank you, everybody. That's all I got for today. Um, that's it. What's that? Okay, two questions. Anybody loading data into Druid these days? No. There's one over there. Um, yeah, so as you aggregate data, um, so, so there's different options in terms of like loading data into Druid. You, you could do whatever aggregation you might want to do outside of Druid first, right? So for us, really often we'll roll up stuff in Hive or we might apply some, some you know, aggregate functions there. Um, I believe the array of aggregators is very well documented on the Druid documentation, but there are the sketches, like the hyper unique stuff for the hyper log log um, you know, aggregators, so more complex aggregators there. And they have pretty much all the aggregators you would expect to find, expect, except for average, because, because that two level of aggregation thing, you, you kind of never want to do an average until the very last moment of your query, right? You want to get the sum of the numerator, denominator, at the very last moment, create that ratio. But yeah, check out the Druid docs on aggregators. They have the full list of everything that's supported. And now with SQL, too, you have kind of everything you would expect to find. That's it. All right, next. All right, give it up for Max Bushmore. <laughs>